Yeah, hello. I hope this finds you well. I wish to welcome you to this uh, second lesson of the unit that is health education. And to start with, I want us to um, first deal with uh, some terms, then we'll go deeper into what is health education. So uh, we have various determinants of health, and these are factors that influence health. We have internal factors and external factors. So uh, health status of a person is determined by two factors. We have internal factors that are within the individual and external factors that are outside the individual that um, surround the individual that is there in the society with, uh, with which the individual lives. There are four major factors that normally influences health of a person. We have human biology, and, it, and this is um, uh, uh, this is the makeup of the human body. So the health status of an individual depends on genetic constitution, um, maturation process, as well as aging process. Before you are born, after you are born, you mature, and after you've matured, you start to age. That's why I'm saying this genetic constitution where an individual's physical and mental characteristics are inherited from the parents through genes uh, during conception. During conception, after you have been conceived, the mother's and the father's genes come together and the genes will determine your mental and physical characteristics. Also, these genes might be modified when you're maturing, and also they might also be modified when you're aging. So all this will determine the health status of a person. For example, you are born very healthy because your mother's and your father's genes were very healthy. But during your maturation process, you're exposed to a lot of uh, chemicals, you are exposed to drugs, you're exposed to a lot of chemicals that interfered with your body. So still maturation process will also interfere with or will also determine your health status as well as when you're aging. Are you, are you exposed also to these chemicals? Are you exposed to good nutrition? This also will also determine your um, health status. Examples of disease that are passed down a family through genetic strain includes sickle cell anemia, asthma, Tangington, Korea, then we have diabetes, Down syndrome, ETC. So also other, uh, we also have cancer that are normally passed from one person or from one uh, uh, generation to the next. So still these genetic traits will also determine your health status. Then the health of an, a fetus is influenced by the health of the mother, her nutritional status, as well as the medical she takes during especially the first three months. So still the health of the fetus, even if the genes are very okay, still the health of the, sister, uh, the fetus after the, it have been conceived will be determined by these factors. How is the mother? Is the mother healthy? Or how is the immuno, uh, immuno, immune status of the mother? What, are, what is the mother exposed to before the fetus is born? What is the nutritional status of the mother? The medication, is the mother taking IFAS? Is the mother taking iron and folic acid supplements when they're pregnant, especially the first three months? So this will determine the health status of the fetus. The fetus. Then this uh, that was under human biology. So as you can see, these are things that the, uh, the human being him, he or she him, uh, herself is exposed to. Then. Another factor that also will determine the health status of a person is environmental factors. Those, this can be either internal or external. Internal, this is factors that are inside the human body. These are part of the human, of the body, and the function within the body systems and how it works. For example, the hemostasis. Is the hemostasis okay? Hemostasis is the mechanism under which the body is able to control its internal environment. So is the body temperature, is the body able to control the body temperatures, the body sugar levels, the body minerals, as well as um, as well as other factors that are inside the body? Is the body able to remove waste products from the human body or not? So um, 
The environmental factors, which includes internal and external environment, will also determine the health status of the person. I was saying when the body is unable to control the internal environment, definitely the health status of a person will be uh, affected. Take an example of a person suffering from diabetes. A person suffering from diabetes is not able to control the level of sugar levels in their body. That's why they have issues. The health status of a person who is suffering from diabetes is deteriorated because the body is not able to control the internal environment. For a person suffering from kidney failure, they're not able to release excess salt, release excess water, release excess or the waste products from the body, and thus the body will have issues. When, when it comes to the external environment, these are things that surround the individual and the individual are exposed to. Is the individual exposed to, um, to chemicals, exposed to bacteria, exposed to stress, exposed to physical issues such as high heat, high pressures, all this. So the external environment can be classified into three. We have biological environment, we have psychosocial environment, and physical environment. When it comes to biological environment, these are as, uh, all living things that surround the man or a human body. Example, we have animals, we have plants, we have fellow men, we have microorganisms such as viruses, bacteria, where all these can contribute to the process of, of infection to a human body. For example, viruses exposes a person to virus infection, bacteria infections, mold infections, yeast infection, kinafla toxins, and the likes. So these are biological environment. Psychosocial environment, man is a social being who interact with other people contributing positively or negatively um, to himself. So how you interact with your fellow men will contribute either positively or negatively to your health status. For example, quarreling leads to stress, which if it is not managed can lead to depression. Depression, remember, it's a disease on its own. Then how man thinks and relates with the different community members has significant impact on health. Many health problems are attributed to poor relationship. This is in view of the fact that people have different personality. When a child, a toddler is exposed to a lot of quarreling around and harsh environment, their health status starts to deteriorate. Even the immune status is affected at that age because the body um, is weak, becomes weak, and they are exposed to a lot of um, issues around them. When they're exposed to harsh conditions, their body's immune system uh, becomes low. And hence, biological as well as psycho psycho psychosocial environment can lead to uh, poor health status of individuals. When it comes to physical environment, this includes housing, water, air, light, noise, etc., which a man can be constantly interact with. For example, if a human being is exposed to radiation, it leads to what? To cancer. If a human being is exposed to a lot of light, definitely the eyesight will be affected. If they are exposed to high noise, definitely the eardrums will also be affected. So this poor ventilation, poor lightning, inadequate and unsafe drinking water, among other things, can be direct or indirect factors which leads to ill health. So we are done with human biology. We are done with internal and external environments. Now we are on lifestyle. Remember, these are factors that influence the health of a human body. So lifestyle refers to the way of living, the way of living <clears throat> uh, or the way of life in a of people in a community. Another individual lifestyle has a significant impact on health. Many health problems are attributed to poor lifestyle, e.g., Sedentary lifestyle, we are not, you're not doing any physical activity or not exercising your body, alcoholism, drug abuse, promiscuous behavior, lack of insertiveness, loose morals may lead to different health conditions, definitely. Then the last factor that may influence the health status of a human being is healthcare services. This refers to all those personal and community services used for prevention and treatment of diseases and promotion of health. So these are uh, personal and community services 
used for prevention and treatment of the diseases and promotion of health. Do we have good healthcare services surrounding the human or the the the, uh, the person in a community or the people living in a community or the population in a community? High or strong health services or good health services definitely will lead to a good health population in that region. If you have poor health services, you will not have good promotion of health, you will not have good preventive measures, you will not have also good treatment measures, as well as rehabilitation measures of people living with chronic diseases. And health is a strong in, is strongly influenced by quality and availability of health services. It's not merely availability of health services alone. You still need quality services or quality health services for good health status of a population. So we have those four factors that normally influence health status of a person. We have human biology, we have uh, environmental factors, we have healthcare services, as well as we have lifestyle of a person. Those are the four major factors that normally influences the health status of a person. Then we have developmental stages of a disease, stages of disease development. How do a disease develop? It is also normally referred to as disease pathway. So disease starts with the first stage, the stage of well-being, where you're very okay, your immune status is very okay, uh, and the person do not have any sign and symptom of any disease. There is no infection at this stage. Then we have stage of susceptibility, where you are exposed to risk factors or factors that lead to um, development of a disease. You are exposed to a lot of viruses, you are exposed to bacteria, you are exposed to stress, you are exposed to accident. So this is the susceptibility stage. At this stage, you are just exposed. And you are yet to have any infection. Then stage number three is pre-symptomatic stage. At this stage, you now exposed, or you know, you now have developed an infection of a certain agent or, or a certain risk factor. So you have infection here, but yet you are not, you, you, you have not yet started to show any sign or symptom of any infection. So at this stage, you can only know that you have a particular infection when you have been taken to the laboratory and tested. Then stage number four is curative state. At this stage, you have started to develop some signs, some signs and symptoms. You have read uh, at that time you really know, even if not you have not gone to any hospital, you know you're not feeling well because signs and symptoms are very prevalent. You can see them or you can feel them. Then at this stage, that's when people go to hospitals or they can start to um, take remedies or even go to take medicine from uh, the pharmacy. Then stage number five is stage of recovery or disability stage. So at this stage, depending on the intervention you take at stage number four, you can never recover from the disease. You can develop disabilities. The disease can go to chronic stage. It was if it is was what uh, was at an active stage. Now you can go to chronic stage. So also, you may fail to recover. So it depends also with the with the with the intervention you took in certain stage number four. That is the curative stage, where the body may fail to overcome the illness, and lastly you die. So we have these stages stages of well being. This when the individual has no medical problems, he has observed the preventive measures, e.g. treatment of water sources, vector control, etc. Then we have stage of susceptibility. The individual is at risk of getting a leanness. This is due to compromised immune system that makes one prone to infection from a pre-existing microorganism or because of exposure to a causative agent or organism. Then you have pre-asymptomatic or symptomatic uh, asymptomatic stage. No signs and symptoms are present, but the patient is already infected. The condition can be diagnosed in the laboratory if tested. 
Then symptomatic stage, this is where the signs and symptoms are clearly felt and seen. Both the patient and the doctor can, evi uh, can evidence these reactions. The lab test can also confirm the specific condition a person is suffering from. Then we have stage of disability. Uh, disability or recovery stage, the patient can either reco uh, they recuperate or deteriorate to disability depending on the severity of the illness and the mode of management used. Depending on the type of disease you're suffering from, depending on the type of um, severity of the illness, and also depending on the management used in the previous stage, you can either develop disability or recover. Then we have the last stage where there is loss of life due to inability oh, yeah. to control infections ability to uh, control infection where there is loss of life due to inability to control an infection or a disease the body can no longer hold up to the effects of the illness and hence individual losses the battle to the disease and dies so those are the stages that a disease normally follows you have the stage of well-being susceptibility stage a symptomatic stage then you have symptomatic stage disability stage and lastly, we have death. Now, once you have the disease, what are the modes of disease prevention do we have? So we have primordial prevention, we have primary prevention, you have secondary prevention, and we have tertiary prevention. So let's go through these types of prevention and understand them well. When it comes to primordial prevention, these are factors in a population group which they have not yet appeared. So special attention is given in prevention of chronic diseases, where main intervention is health education. At this time, you're just educating people because you want to prevent things that may occur in future. They have not yet occurred. The diseases have not yet occurred, but you're just educating them to prevent them or to equip them to overcome the diseases that may occur in future. In this effort, uh, the effort are dedicated towards discouraging people from adopting harmful lifestyle, harmful habits through individual and mass education. Premedial prevention is a relatively new concept in receiving special attention in the prevention of chronic diseases. An example, many adult health problems such as obesity, hypertension, have their early origin with childhood because this is the time when lifestyle are formed. E.g., smoking, eating patterns, physical uh, physical exercises are normally encouraged. So, um, at this primordial uh, prevention stage, people are encouraged to practice good behavior or go, uh, uh, good. Um, or should I call them relatively um, acceptable behavior? Acceptable behavior that leads to good health. So, primordial prevention begins in childhood when health risk behavior begins. Parents, teachers, and peer groups are important in impacting health education to children. Once you teach a child that taking alcohol could lead to this, taking or Drinking alcohol leads to this, smoking cigarettes or taking drugs leads to this, eating good nutrition leads to positive health. Definitely, they will live with that knowledge in them. So it is very um, recommended that this health education start at the childhood level because majority of the diseases that we normally suffer later in life, they started to of uh to occur they started to develop in us at a very early stage <clears throat> so the examples of premedial prevention we have national policies and programs such as food and nutrition comprehensive policies of discouraging smoking alcohol and drugs to promote regular physical activities making major changes in lifestyle all these are examples of primordial prevention then we have prima, uh, primary prevention as the second type of prevention. And it's defined as the action taken prior to the onset of the disease, which removes the possibility that the disease will ever occur. In this action, 
actions are taken before the onset of the disease and it is significant uh, significant significant intervention in the pre pathogenesis phase of the disease or the health problems this includes the concept of positive health a concept that encourages achievement and maintenance of an acceptable level of health that that will enable every individual to lead a socially and economically productive life um I want to enlarge this for us to be able to see well. So in primary uh, prevention, so in primary prevention, we are impacting strategies and intervention it, that enables people to increase control over the determinants of health and thereby improving the health. So we have the various way under which we can do this. And we have two ways under which we can do this. We have health education through health educating people and as well as use of specific protective ways. So giving health education can be in very many forms. Um, this can be through nutrition intervention, this can be environmental modification, it can also be lifestyle and behavioral changes. Um, this can also be use of specific protection efforts. So these efforts are directed towards protection against specific infection, e.g. when you're immunizing against measles, you're preventing the person from measles. Use of specific nutrients. For example, when you're giving vitamin A to children, you're preventing night blindness, you're preventing blindness in children later in life. And you're giving IFAS to pregnant mothers, you're protecting against birth defects of their unborn baby. And you're giving drugs such as chloroquine for malaria, you're preventing the people that are prone to malaria regions or that are exposed to these malaria parasites from getting the malaria. When you're protecting against occupation hazards, such as educate, educating people on wearing gears when they're in factories that have uh, that are exposed to or that are you, you, in factories that are highly likely to suffer from accidents. When you're protecting against accidents, such as encouraging use of helmets when you're riding a border border or use of seat, seat belts in motorcycles. So all these are geared towards specific protection. So control of general environment, avoidance of allergens, all these are geared towards specific protection against specific infections. So you can give health education as well as you can use specific protection when we are doing primary prevention. So the third prevention is secondary prevention which is an action which halts the progress of a disease at uh, uh, at this uh, at at the, uh, the at the chronic stage or the clinical stage of disease and prevents complications so at the clinical stage of the disease if we can remember the stages of disease development that's where we put secondary prevention mechanisms and these specific interventions are geared towards early diagnosis and referral so early diagnosis the disease complications can be prevented and health can be restored by diagnosing the disease at an early stage and by providing the adequate treatment according to the health problems so early diagnosis ensures that the disease has been treated before it develops into a severe state if you're diagnosed with cancer before it gets to the chronic stage of the severe state or the other stages or the, the stage level two or the level three of cancer development, you'll be able to overcome that cancer. But if the cancer was will be diagnosed at the very late stages, you might die for uh, due to the cancer development. So it is very uh, good to early diagnose some of these diseases. So this... Uh, Early diagnosis includes arrests or treatment that are normally geared towards this um, early diagnosis includes arrests, arrests or stop 
the disease process, restore the health, treatment, uh, treat the disease before irreversible pathological changes occur, and reverse the communicability of infectious diseases. So the early diagnosis helps in all this. You will, it, it will help stop the disease process before it gets to the severe stages, restore health at an early stage, treat the disease before it, it gets one irreversible pathological changes, then it will also help to overcome communi uh, communicability or spread of the disease, uh, even in case it is an infectious disease. Then secondary prevention attempts to arrest the disease process, restore health by seeking out and recognized disease and treating it before irreversible pathological changes takes place and reverse communicability of infectious diseases. I think I've already done that. It protects other, others in the community from acquiring the infection and thus provide at once secondary prevention for the infect, infected ones and primary prevention for those potential contacts. So if, for example, you have a corona patient in your home and that, that person is diagnosed early enough using the secondary prevention mechanisms. So you will be prevented from getting infection or from getting the corona since it is spread from one person to the other. And also that person will also be cured so that the disease will be arrested and the disease will not progress to the severe state that is irreversible. So that's the work of secondary prevention. Then objectives of secondary prevention includes complete cure, prevention of spread, prevention of complication that may develop due to the disease or from the disease, then to shorten the period of disability. Those are objectives of secondary prevention. Then in tertiary, the last uh, stage of disease prevention is or levels of disease prevention is tertiary prevention. And this is used when the disease process has advanced beyond its early stages. So for example, you've already developed disability or the disease have already gone to chronic stage that is not reversible. That's where the tertiary prevention comes in. And tertiary prevention comes into two ways. Disability limitation, you don't get more disability in you. For example, if you lost your kidney ability and you've gotten uh, kidney failure, the work of tertiary prevention is to prevent other organs from getting to disability level. And rehabilitation, you rehabilitate that person. So primary prevention, tertiary prevention, sorry, involves these two things. Disease, uh, di limit disability, limitation of disability and uh, rehabilitation. Let's see what is limitation of disability. This is to prevent or halt the transition of disease process from impairment and handicap. You're preventing or you're halting the process of development of impairment and handicap. What is impairment? It is any loss or abnormality of psychological, physical, or anatomical structure or function. Let's take an example. If you're involved in an accident and you lose your hand, that is impairment because you have lost your anatomical structure. You've lost your hand. If you're involved in a very tra uh, uh, in a trauma that is very severe, you lose maybe your psychological ability. You might become mad or you might develop or you might get into a depression that is impairment when it comes to disability it is any restriction or lack of ability to perform an activity in the manner considered normal of a human being if you lost your hand you'll not be able to use your hand or maybe you'll not be able to feed yourself due to that you you're disabled then Disability leads to handicap. Handicap, it is a disadvantage for a given individual resulting from impairment or disability that limits or prevents the fulfillment of a role that is normal for an individual. Let me give this example. If you have a dental caries, that is 
uh, that is impairment. If you lose your teeth, that is disability. Uh, sorry, if you have dental caries, you have you're exposed to getting disability, uh, getting an impairment when you lose your teeth. Then, if you're unable to talk because you've lost a lot of your teeth, this is disability. Then, uh, if you're not able, you you feel alone. People segregate you or leave you, you you alone. You're not able to interact with with other people because you you don't have teeth or not. You are not able to talk. This is handicap. So we have these um these three. We have disability here. We have uh sorry impairment here. We have disability here, and we have handicap here. Let's take an example when you're involved in an accident. When you're involved in an accident and you lose your hand, you'll have you'll be impaired because you've lost your anatomical structure. Then, if you're unable to eat by yourself, you've developed disability. If you're not able to do other activities that a normal person who has who is, who is having the hand that like oh, for example that you've lost you're not able to interact well with other people and that's when you say you are handicapped so this um limiting of disability normally helps or is a tertiary way of or tertiary level of prevention disease prevention that helps um people from getting the disability. Then another way is rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is a combined and coordinated use of medical, social, educational, and vocational measures of, for training and retaining the individual to the highest possible level of functioning ability. So it includes educational, social, and vocational measures for training and retaining the individual to the highest possible level of functional ability. So, for example, the medical rehabilitation involves restoration of bodily function. You can use an artificial hand here. So that will be medical rehabilitation. Vocational rehabilitation is the restoration of the capacity to earn a livelihood. For example, if you're handicapped, you don't have a leg, you're not able to walk, the doctors come in here to give you an artificial leg. And now that you're able to walk, we can educate you or we can give you or you can take you to um, a school for those who are have handicap for you to be able to have or to add to or to be able to have a capacity to earn a live or live or live uh, or live like any uh, like any other person. Then we have social rehabilitation, where there is restoration of family and social relationship. So in social rehabilitation, we can use counseling because you want to uh, retain your social well-being. You're able to interact well with other people, whether it comes to family, whether it comes to the community. Then 